Hello. When I was a little girl, the first time I ever saw the movie The Wizard of Oz, all I could think about was munchkins and witches and Toto. But as years went by and I continued to see this iconic film, the message changed for me. When I was a preteen, I was going through puberty and adolescence, and middle school was the pits. My life seemed very bleak. But when I would put on my dance shoes and go to my dance class, my life became technicolor. My Emerald City was going to be Broadway. I was going to have a road to stardom, and I could hardly wait. So when I was 16, 17, and 18, I was in the dancing chorus of the St. Louis Muni Opera. Now, that's me, second from the right. And I was one step away from New York when I met my husband-to-be. I fell madly in love, got married, and moved to Kansas, of all places. <laughs> So now, here I am. Uh, we have three children. I'm a homemaker. And all of my dreams of being a dancer are kind of buried really deep. I adored my husband. I adored my children, and I still do. But I have to admit that there were moments when I said to myself, what if? What if? Well, when I was in my 30s, my life took a dramatic turn, way out of my comfort zone. I was going to go on an entirely different road, and my scarecrow was going to be a patient in a psychiatric hospital. My tin woodsman was going to be a prisoner in a correctional facility and my cowardly lion was going to be a special needs student in a middle school. Now, as I started on this very unexpected road and had no idea where it was going to take me, I need to tell you that it was not a tornado that made it happen. It was a phone call. I received a phone call from the director of volunteer services at Osawatomie State Hospital. And some patients had asked her if she could find somebody that would come and teach dance lessons to them. And she learned about me that I was a dancer, and she called and wondered if I would consider coming to Osawatomie and teach dance lessons. Well, I was very intrigued. And I was going to have an opportunity to honor this dancer and me that was still deep inside. So off I went to Osawatomie. And I wasn't there very long when she connected me with a psychiatrist. And he approached me and he said, I would like to suggest that you create a musical production and use all of the members of your cast, patients, here in the hospital. And I explained to him that there was no way I could possibly do this. I didn't know anything about psychiatry. I had no idea how to treat psychiatric patients. And it was just out of my range. He looked at me and he said, don't treat them as psychiatric patients. Treat them as performers. Make demands on them and help them discover something beautiful and valuable about themselves that's deep inside that they don't know. So, Judy Garland-like, I started on my own yellow brick road and said, let's put on a show. <laughs> so, here we are at the first rehearsal. And there are about 35 patients on stage. 
and I'm teaching them um, a song, a parody that I'd written to that entertainment, and it went, we just want to be in the show, yes, we just want to part even though we'll be stuck in the very back row, but still it's showbiz. And everything was going beautifully, except I started noticing this young man who was tall and very awkward. His face was filled with acne and zits. He couldn't carry a tune to save his life, and he had two left feet. So, and he had red hair that was going in all different directions. Little did I know that this was going to be my scarecrow. So I went up to Guy and I said, Guy, I need you in that back row over there. There's, there's a space and you need to fill it and it will be just perfect. And Guy went into the back row and we started rehearsing and the next thing I know, Guy's in the front row. <laughs> I kept trying to persuade him, coming up with all different kinds of reasons about why it was so important for him to be in the back row. And he would go in the back row and they would start singing and there was Guy inching his way front and center. So every day I would get in my car and I would drive home from the rehearsals and I would say to myself, I have to find something beautiful and valuable about Guy. And all I could think about was that he was spoiling my show. So comes the dress rehearsal and there's this great big costume trunk and everybody got to pick out any costume they wanted. But when Guy reached in, I went over to him and I said, Guy, I have such a costume for you. And it was a tuxedo that was very, very big for him. And the pants, the legs fell over his shoes. And the sleeves came down below his fingers. And the top hat practically covered his eyes. So now it's opening performance. And I'm sitting in the audience with this big knot in my stomach and the piano starts to play and the curtains open and there is Guy front and center and the first chorus, he pulls a scarf out of his sleeve. The second chorus, he reached into his pocket and he pulled out a deck of cards. The last chorus, he took off his hat and he pulled out a stuffed rabbit. And Guy became the star of the show not because of me, but in spite of me. He transformed my disguise for him into a magician. And it was a magical moment. And I learned so much from my scarecrow. He had used his brain in such a magical way. So one of the first things that I learned was that I needed to learn how to see people for what was on their inside instead of what was on the outside. I needed to appreciate there is a spark of creativity in everyone if we would just give them the opportunity to express it. Well, my tin woodsman came in the form of an inmate at the Lansing Correctional Facility. Many, many years ago, over 30 years ago, uh, a man who was serving a life sentence and I met and we started collaborating on a curriculum. And this curriculum covered child abuse, spouse abuse, sexual abuse, forgiveness, anger management, addiction, self, spirituality. It was fabulous and this inmate took these topics and turned them into a Socratic method. And so he would open up by saying something about child abuse and then he would say, is there anyone in this room that could share something personal and lighten us about child abuse? And the stories would pour out. And all these many years that I've been going to these weekly meetings, I am in the presence of people who have learned to become therapists for themselves and each other. Their conversations are so intense, they're so intimate, there's laughter, there's tears, 
And I am in awe of being in their presence and they continue to inspire me. I have so many stories I could tell you. But the most recent one took place when they were on the unit on forgiveness. And the inmates lead their own discussion. So an inmate who was leading this discussion got to the word atonement. And he noticed that there was one inmate that was squirming and writhing in his chair. And he went over and he stood in front of Damon and he said, Damon, there's something, something going on with you. What's wrong? And Damon said, I can never atone. When I was 18, I killed an 18-year-old man. And it doesn't make any difference what I do, how much I try to atone. I can never bring that man's life back to him. And there was this silence. And then CJ got up, walked over, crossed the room, stood in front of Damon, and he said, Damon, I destroyed two people's lives. I killed a woman, and I deprived her daughter, her seven-year-old daughter, of a mother. He said, I've been in prison for 29 years, and for so long I was stuck in my shame, my remorse, my guilt. And one day I realized that my life had been spared. I had a life, and I needed to do something to deserve it. So I decided to forgive myself and find some meaning and purpose for my life here in this prison, to help other people forgive themselves, to reach out in any way that I could to make a difference with my life. He said, Damon, you know where my bunk is. Anytime you want to come to me and talk about forgiveness, I will be there for you. And I learned from CJ about how you can open your heart in a place that no one would have ever expected compassion to exist. I learned that we should never define a person by the worst thing they have ever done. My cowardly lion came in the form of this special needs student in a middle school. I've been doing bullying work for a number of years now, and I've written some books uh, on the topic, and I get invited to speak all over the country, and especially in Kansas. And I remember a day when I was standing in an auditorium watching all the sixth grade students in a middle school file in. And I noticed a teacher with 10 or 12 special needs students kind of walk in towards the end and sit in a special section. And I stood up and I started talking to them about the five kinds of bullying, physical, verbal, emotional, sexual, and cyber. And um, when we got to verbal, I always turn to the students and I say, would you please finish this sentence? Sticks and stones can break your bones, but... So class, sticks and stones can break your bones, but... Words will never hurt me. Every child in America has learned that sentence. And it's been handed down for at least five generations that I know, because my grandmother learned it and my grandchildren have learned it. And so then I went on and I asked them questions. I, I try to capture their hearts with stories and capture their minds with questions. So I asked them, why does somebody become a bullier? Um, What's the difference between the way girls and boys bully? And what can you do to make it stop? And then I get to empathy. And I say to the kids, this is so important that I need you to do something. I would like every single one of you to please close your eyes. And I want you to put yourself in the skin of someone that is hurting. I want you to be there. And I watch them empathize, and I can see it in their body language. And then I say after a bit, 
Would you all please open your eyes now, and I'm going to ask the most difficult question of all. I wonder if because of all the things that we've shared with each other and talked about, I wonder if some of you have a conscience that's bothering you. I wonder if someone would like to heal a broken heart. I wonder, is there anyone in this room that would like to make an apology? And a boy in the special needs section raised his hand. So I walked over to him and I saw his name tag and I said, Tony, who do you need to apologize to? And he said, everybody in this room. So I invited him to come down and stand in front of the auditorium and he looked out at everybody and he said, I want to apologize to every single one of you. Every day I scream at you. I curse at you. I swear at you. I call you the most horrible names. And he said, but the reason I do it is because of the way you treat me. There isn't one person in this room that would trade places with me for just one day. If you would leave me alone, I'll leave you alone. And with that, he walked back to his seat and left the rest of us dissolved in tears. And from Tony, I learned that you can have the courage to apologize, to take responsibility when you've done something wrong, and that you can have the courage to stand up for yourself even when you're suffering. So what have I learned on this journey to us? So many things. I've learned about creativity. I've learned about compassion. I've learned about courage. I've learned about resilience. I have learned that people in pain have experiences that give them so much wisdom that they share with us when we allow them to. And I have learned that the most exciting and fulfilling journey that I could have ever had would not have been in some exotic city. It was a journey within myself. And Dorothy was right. There is no place like home. Thank you.